Okay, hi everybody. Thank you so much for coming out on this rather beautiful New York City Spring Day uh, and joining us for the Co-opting AI event <coughs> on work. My name is Dr. Mona Sohn. I'm a sociologist here at IPK. I'm also an adjunct professor at NYU's Tannen School of Engineering where I'm gonna teach design inequality from the fall. And I'm also the convener of the Co-opting AI series. Uh, my own research is focused on design and inequality, particularly in the context of artificial intelligence design practice and also policy. Um, the event tonight will be comprised of a film screening of the documentary Cyber Work in the American Dream, and then we're going to follow up with a panel discussion with the two filmmakers, uh, Professor Elizabeth Cobbs and James Shelley, as well as Dr. Madeline Claire Ellish and Eduardo Porter. I'm going to introduce the panel after the film screening, just so that you have their bios fresh on their mind um, and sort of can place what they say. Now before I introduce, um, b or before we start the film screening, I just wanna say a few words about the event series. So essentially, the Co-opting AI series sort of do what it says on the tin, as the Brits like to say. Um, they set out to co-opt AI. Now what does that mean? The thing that we call AI increasingly plays a role in all kinds of social interactions and social organizations, from production to consumption, to transport, navigation, job hunting, recruiting, securing a loan, finding a place to live, reading the news, communicating with others, all the way to policing and criminal justice, and there are many more examples. So as this is happening, we are sort of engulfed by a narrative that positions artificial intelligence as the determinant for our collective future, above all else. Above all else? I think that this could turn out to be a rather slippery, slippery slope. With all the noise around technolo technological aspects of AI, we are increasingly distracted or seemingly rendered paralyzed from asking what is really at stake as we move forward into a sort of new socio-technological future. And I think really that it is at this point that AI almost ironically, comes in handy because it actually prompts us to ask big questions and reevaluate them, questions about power, democracy, and inequality, and really what it means to be human. I think we should take this prompt seriously. We should co-opt the AI discourse to keep asking these bigger questions to, and to ask them not just from an economical or technological point of view, but include diverse social, political, historical perspectives, but sort of without going down the rabbit holes of either techno-solutionism or techno-skepticism. And this is really what the Co-opting AI series are all about, taking AI as a cue to have broader conversations about society, design, technology, economy, inequality, and democracy. And this is really rather well within IPK's traditions of creating a public space for public discourse. Now, without sort of further ado, let's start the film. Um, just a little housekeeping, bathrooms are around the corner. Um, there are snacks and drinks. Um, after the a film, we're gonna start the panel discussion, and as I said, I'm gonna introduce everybody. But for now, please enjoy the movie. Okay, thank you so much for uh, bringing that film to IPK and um, sharing it with us. Um, I'm gonna introduce our panel. So, we have in the lovely green jacket, <laughs> Professor Elizabeth Cobbs, who is one of the filmmakers. She earned her PhD in American history at Stanford University. She now holds the Melbourne Glasscock Chair at Texas A&M University and is a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. She writes a lot. She successfully writes fiction and nonfiction, and her books have won four literary prizes. Elizabeth has been a Fulbright Scholar in Ireland and a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. She also served on the Historical Advisory Committee of the U.S. State Department and on the jury for the Pulitzer Prize in History. Next to Elizabeth, to the left, we have James Shelley, who also is one of the two filmmakers with us here tonight. He is the owner of Shell Studios, a San Diego-based production company that specializes in award-winning documentaries and commercial films. His most recent film was American Umpire, which won Best Documentary at the 2016 GI Film Festival. And I think you have worked previous together on film projects. 
then we have to the left of James, Eduardo Porter, who is an economics reporter for the business section of the New York Times, where he was the economic scene columnist from 2012 to 2018. He also is the co-author of a forthcoming book about race and the American social contract. Eduardo began his career in journalism over two decades ago as a financial reporter for Nodimex, a Mexican news agency in Mexico City. He was deployed as a correspondent to Tokyo and London, and in 1996, he moved to Sao Paulo, Brazil, as editor of America Economia, a business magazine. In 2000, he went on to work at the Wall Street Journal in Los Angeles to cover the growing Hispanic population. He joined the New York Times in 20, uh, 2004, to cover economics. From 2007 to 2012, he was a member of the Times editorial board where he wrote about business, economics, and a mix of other matters. Then, to my left, we have Dr. Madeline Claire Elish, who is a cultural anthropologist and whose work examines the social impacts of AI and automation on society. She currently leads the Intelligence and Auto Autonomy Initiative at Data and Society here in New York. The, the Intelligence and Autonomy Initiative aims to reframe debates about the rise of AI and reposition the value of human intelligence in the design, deployment, and evaluation of AI-driven systems. Her recent work has investigated how AI technology affect understandings of value and ethical norms and how professional work lives change in response. She has conducted field work across varied industries and communities, ranging from the Air Force, civilian drone regulation and commercial aviation, to precision agriculture and emergency clinical care. Her research has been published and cited in both scholarly as well as other publications, including the New York Times, Slate, Vice, and USA Today. She holds a PhD in anthropology from Columbia University and an SM in comparative media studies from MIT. Please join me in welcoming our panel. this work? Yes, wonderful. Great, so we have a lot to talk about. I think this was a really interesting film that sort of conjured up a lot of questions and touched a lot on a lot of very important themes. And so um, I want to start by asking Madeline, who is coming from field work today, who is doing field work today, about sort of, sorry, last week, about um, sort of the idea that AI sort of affects sort of top-down effects um, our lives and sort of whether that notion is really helpful in thinking about uh, a sort of the future of artificial intelligence. And also, that's the first one. And the second part to my question is um, the notion, which is related, the notion of precarity that we sort of see and hear in the AI discourse, which is, this has been problematized in the film too, like we hear all the jobs are gonna be replaced what sort of, if we dig a little deeper, what kind of stories lie behind that that we need to hear? Great, well, thank you. Uh, is this on? You can hear yeah. me okay? Okay, great. Um, I just, it's, it's an honor to be on this panel with all of you. Um, and I am also gonna uh, take the, the sort of older bio that Mona read about, um, aiming to reframe uh, and reconceptualize the discussions that we have around AI. AI. I'm gonna take that to heart and maybe be a little, um, provocative on this on this panel. Um, so I think uh, I'll start, Mona, with your second point um, about this idea of precarity. Um, I think uh, one thing that as an anthropologist, my methods are well positioned to do is to um, help us see what is actually happening on the ground. Um, there are a lot of uh, talking heads in, in, this, um, in this documentary, and so it's anthropology and other kinds of methods that are, whether they're sort of activist-based methods, activist-based uh, research methods, or all kinds of other, anyways, you get the point. They can help us see what's on the ground. Um, and I think that we definitely are seeing a lot of precarity um, that is arising alongside a lot of the technical innovations that we're seeing. Um, I guess beginning, before beginning further, one of the sort of, um, I guess things that I 
I would disagree with about the framing of the problems as they are in the documentary is that a lot of that precarity is not actually because of the technologies. It's because of the economic policies that have gone along with those, the rise of those technologies. Um, and so I think it's really important to kind of decenter the the sort of role that technology has in sort of plowing through society and to sort of acknowledge all of the different ways in which these these changes sort of happen at systemic policy levels. Um, but to get at your question about some of my some of my field work, um, actually one of my um, co-authors is here in the audience, Alexandra Matiscu. Um, we looked at how uh, AI technologies are changing the way retail, grocery retailers work and also the way some farmers work. Um, and what we find is precisely that the kind of narratives around wholesale replacement are really not, not not what we're seeing in the future, which I think the the documentary really sort of points toward. Um, but what we see is not just the way in which jobs are changing, but also how the humans who support systems to work are um, made invisible. And so a lot of the technologies that we talk about today as being AI or automated actually have huge amounts of human labor that is either making them intelligent or that is actually integrating them into social contexts. And so it's really, again, important for me to kind of decenter the omnipotence of technology and to refocus all of the kinds of humans that are sort of propping up a lot of the sort of technology narratives that are, that are going on. I could talk forever, but I'll, I'll Thank sorry, you. that was the shortest Thank I you. could that, do. That's a, that's a nice cue to ask. Um, Elizabeth and James about sort of you end on the notion of education and sort of you 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 know you crack open a whole bunch of questions uh, and issues. So asking against the backdrop of that, having made the film, but also as an educator yourself, Elizabeth. Ideally, if you could think of you know if you, if you could dream up tomorrow the ideal word of edu uh, of education um, in the context of technology in the future. What would that look like? What, you know? And I'm asking that sort of with my European hat on. <laughs> oh, European head, interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, all these, and I'm interested, Eduardo, of course, has lived all around the world and seen these issues play out in lots of different contexts. So it'll be interesting to hear him say it based on what you're talking about, social policies, because some of the issues are the same wherever you go. So the governments keep changing, but the po underlying policies are. A lot of them very similar, so I'm very curious to hear about that. Um, as an educator, I, I loved what James Manika said when he said, you know, I want my son to learn how to learn. Uh, or when Mark Cuban says, I love to learn. I think that um, as educators, we've not developed systems which support that outcome very well, uh, getting people to love learning. Um, and I'm a part of a system which you know, <laughs> perpetuates some of those older models. I mean, I don't know all of how to fix that, but I do think one thing we have, one problem is, uh, is with teachers. Not, I mean, teachers are great. I'm a teacher. I, you know, I think there are a lot of wonderful teachers. Right now, we do have systems set up which don't give teachers a lot of incentives to do better than they are able to do. I mean, any system where pay, people stay in because and they're, and progress according to seniority, you know, has problems um, with the creating incentives for people. Um, and so it's kind of it's kind of hard, you know. Who wants to talk smack on teachers? I mean, I love teachers. I have a daughter who's a teacher. My mother was a teacher, but the systems that we have currently don't compensate really good teachers well enough. I have three members of my family who teach abroad because they can make more as teachers teaching foreign students than they can teaching American students, and they're you know, teachers who are protected by unions, but are not doing are not creating the right outcomes. So I think that we have to figure that out. And it's not because there's a specific thing that everybody needs to learn how to do. In fact, one of the people in the film um, or who started this school called Harmony, I recently was on a panel with him and he, he's you know, spent 15, 16 years trying to develop schools which would teach STEM education. He says, my next project, we need to work on schools which teach emotional education and, and, and you know, emotional intelligence and that's the next step. 
that's the next phase, which I think is so interesting because this is what people are saying in the film as well, some of these experts, that those are the f jobs of the future. You know, the things that make us really human. So I don't know, Jim, you have things to add on that? Um, yeah, I, and I, um, one of the reasons we made the film in the way we did is that there, is a lot of, there are a lot of films out there that talk about AI and robots which make you want to hide in your closet and just say, you know, this is horrible, they're coming for us, they're taking over the planet. And to me, I think that warps the conversation we need to have, which is around our social systems and our education systems and our safety nets. Uh, those are really the important conversations, and as Astra Teller says, you know, the, the fear should not be of the technology, it's of, of, it's of our social systems and how they can support the transition. And we've seen it before, we've, you know, it's one of the reasons we go back and look at history, is to remind us that we've been through these huge technological changes before, um, whether it was steam or electricity or computers. They've always been extremely difficult, and a lot of people have been displaced, and it hasn't been pretty, as Neil Ferguson says. But at the end of the day, these changes have brought enormous improvements to our lives today. Penicillin, airplanes, life expectancy. So, you know, the big picture is these huge um, revolutions, which we're going through right now, have happened in the past, they have been difficult, but we've gotten through them before. The conversations I think we need to have are um, uh, what can we learn from the things that worked in the past to help us get through there, and how can we change the systems we have today? I mean, uh, you know, the safety net we have today was built for the 1930s, right? When you had a big factory in a rural town and it would shut down during the business cycle and the government would subsidize the corporation to keep people <laughs> around until the business cycle picked up again and then they would be rehired. That economy doesn't exist anymore. And so um, how do we retool our safety nets to, for the gig economy, et cetera? So I appreciate you know, the, the fact that we can have these conversations because I think they're really important. Yeah, I have a few thoughts on that, but I want to ask Eduardo um, sort of two, I think this is on, two inter interlinked um, questions or touch upon two issues which I, which I think are linked. The one is being, in the film is being said that oh, unionizing is not happening anymore, you know, nobody's in union, which as a matter of fact, there's a reverse trend in the tech industry which is sort of coming together and there, there's unionization going on. It's kind of a, a hot thing right now. Um, so that's one thing and you wrote, recently wrote a piece about hotel workers, I think, unionizing. So maybe you can give a bit, bit of context on the idea of unionizing in the the future of work and artificial intelligence, that's one. <laughs> Two is about UBI. And we talked about this before we started the event. Is UBI really gonna, you know, save a problem that we don't know we will really have? Okay, let me, <clears throat> let me take the first one first. And I'll try to embed it in your, in Elizabeth's observation about the importance of institutions and how they affect how technologies are deployed and what effects they have on the broader society. Now, um, I would point out just specifically about unions that um, technology, I, I, to, to uh, uh, agree that we should not take a technology-centric view of, of all social and economic change is that um, um, we, I, w I would argue that we have a lot of different experiences of unionization across the world, and these experiences, these different experiences of unionizations are associated with very different outcomes in terms of the impact that technologies like automation have had on the workforce. So the kind of crisis of disemployment that you have in the United States um, is very unique to the United States. It is embedded in a set of policy choices um, and it is embedded in, you know, in perhaps other social arrangements. But if you look, for instance, at Germany, Germany has a much higher rate of automation than the United States does. Or Korea has a much higher rate of automation than the United States does. But the institutions of a stronger labor union there, as well as other, you know, other basic data institutions. Data protection, by the way, both countries, ironically, have very strong data protection. Uh, right? um, indeed. Um, also stronger safety nets. Um, although that's not always moving in the right direction, but still on average stronger safety nets, um, have, have led to an entirely different outcome with, which is with much less deprivation and marginalization. 
So that's just to, to agree that there are different ways of doing this. And I could say that very specifically about, this could even affect the, the pace and the type of, of automation going forward. So there, there has been some economic research, mainly by Daron Asimoglu at MIT, who has started questioning what is motivating a lot of the investment in automation right now, and whether it is in fact increasing productivity, which is the good thing that all these people are talking about, or whether it is in fact to take advantage of a tax benefit that you get from replacing a person with a robot. So, Give, and his argument, his, his strong suggestion, more than a strong suggestion, is that indeed that's true, that the productivity gains that we're getting from a lot of these instances of automation over the last 20, 30 years have not really done a great deal of enhancing productivity. And that might, in fact, help explain why productivity growth in the United States, despite all this whiz bang stuff, is growing very, very slow by historical standards. And so he say, but we have this tax regime, so robots don't pay payroll taxes. And so for the individual business, there is clearly an incentive to automate when so there's, a, there's a social externality that it doesn't have to pay. And so therefore, um, we automate faster than we should. Um, now, as to what technology means for the future unionization, my guess is that it's nothing good. Um, and again, I would, I, 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 would, I would speak more, mostly about the United States. In the United States, every opportunity to reduce, to, to, to get rid of unions has been taken. And whatever advances are happening in the tech sector, we have 7% of workers in the United States are members of unions. I mean, it's very dramatically low. And this had to do with laws that allowed companies to set up in states where they did not have to allow a union to operate. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but, but, but it was clearly a set of political choices that led to this deunionization. Yeah. If you ask me what sectors I think could revert this trend, I think that things like hotel workers, janitors, service sector, McDonald's employees, service sectors at the bottom end where there's, you know, where international competition is, is not that big a deal, where the employer must stay there because that's where the burgers are bought. Those offer opportunities for some form of collective action. I'm not sure that you're going to see unions like of the old AFL-CIO type, the big industrial unions. My guess is that they're going to be likely much more fluid collectives, a bit like the Fight for 15, and a lot of the labor organizing is not going to be to negotiate with management on, on a raise, but maybe it's going to be to put pressure on the political system to, you know, to get uh, uh, legislation passed, to get minimum wages ri rise in that. Technology, to the extent that it is going to allow businesses to separate themselves even more from workers, which is one of the other consequences of technology that has gone over for tens, hundreds of years, it's allowed, um, you know, it allowed for outsourcing because, you know, IT, you could monitor your workers. They didn't have to be in the same company. You could, you know, just farm it out. And right now we have what's known as the ghost work where so many of these companies don't really employ workers but use little bits of times of people that are scattered all over the place. So I would, I would think that technology is going to further allow for the distancing between the employer and the employee, weakening the, the link, weakening the responsibilities. And so I don't think, I think that's gonna make unionizing much more difficult. Now, about UBI, um, I'm, I'm a skeptic, I'm on record. I got trashed on Twitter for saying that I thought it was nonsense. Um, uh, um, and I do think, uh, a couple of things. A, it's hugely expensive. Well, hey, first, UBI is not one thing. UBI is 27 different things. Uh, and so yet we have to be kind of precise what we're talking about. Are we talking of a slight subsidy that's, you know, is not going to feed you uh, and you, you're still going to need to supplement by employment of some sort? Are we talking something that really can take the place of a job? Is it like these guys are, if, if you're, if you're portraying a future with no employment, do we need something that takes over the entire job that employment used to have to keep people alive? Um, or is it, you know, $200, $200 a month? So if you start getting into real money, it gets very expensive very fast. 
ten thousand dollars a a year per person, which is you know about the poverty line, um, already gets you three and a half trillion dollars worth of of spending, which is like a humongous uh, uh, amount of money that I could not I I cannot imagine the American political system to d deliver anything near that scale. And sure, you'll tax back some of it from high. Uh, from high earners, but it's still a very, very heavy lift. I mean, getting you know something like universal childcare here is like impossible. So um, I think it's just it's like a sh you know Astro Teller is into moonshots. Well, <laughs> this is a moonshot. Um, um, and on the other on the other hand, um, I would say that this is not really the problem that we had. And somebody somebody up there made this. Maybe it was McAfee. That it's not we we don't have we're not facing. I don't think even in the distant future, a future of zero employment, of disemployment. I think we face a future of crummy employment. And so I think that the solutions should be around that reality. And I agree with Manika that jobs are not just money. Jobs are, have been the center of how we organize our lives for you know, hundreds of years. So just assuming, it, assuming employment away, is, I think, is a little nuts. But um, um, the idea that we need to somehow improve the livelihoods, the employment, maybe the productivity of the employment of you know, two-thirds of the population who does not have a bachelor's degree, I think that's the challenge. And there are tools out there. You don't really need to kind of like reorganize capitalism to do these things. I mean, there are things called the earned income tax credit. There are childcare subsidies. There are training programs, which, in, by the way, the Unite for All this talk about skilling constant. The United States has a, spends the least share uh, uh, in, 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 in training of any industrialized country, so in training for uh, people in the workplace. So uh, th there's a bunch of stuff that you get to before saying, we gotta be twice as generous as Norway, because we're not even gonna get to Norway. Um, and, and, so, and, and finally, I would agree, I, you know, when you get to real money, the disemployment effect that of, of UBI is, is certainly non-zero. I'm not sure it's enormous, but it's non-zero. And, and I, I do think that it's worth thinking about. I don't think it should be just kind of like discarded as, you know, irrelevant concern by neoliberals. I, I do think that that you do want to you, you do want to keep the centrality of work I, 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 as a motor economy. So, thank you for that. Um, that sort of brings me to a a question that I have for everybody, and that comes out of my my own research interests and um, on design and inequality. And I think for me, the elephant in the room, not the one that got electrocuted. The one that's still there, and it's really horrible, <laughs> is um, inequality. And so I see sort of inequality in my research on artificial intelligence in many different ways. Um, you know, we, we heard about the bias data, and, and, um, but we also must think about sort of social systems and, and society as structured around inequalities for a long time, and so questioning as we move forward with artificial intelligence and work in social life, maybe we need to address these bigger structures. How do we do that? Um, the tech industry, um, the absence of affected communities who have to live with that, so, um, and also the professionals who have to work in uh, these technologies who are not necessarily being part of the um, conversation. And we had a little example in there about airplanes as an example of AI that, that works. And I mean, we're, we all fly around all the time and are polluting the planet. But, m but Madeline is, has done really interesting work on what happens when a plane crashes and sort of what, what sort of happens to um, the system of responsibility when that happens. And can you maybe cue us in a little bit there and sort of make the link? Sure, I'll do my best because I had one response to the question as it was being set up. Okay, and then, then start with it. No, start. Response. You can happy. Start with that, um, and then. Well, I'll just sort of. Um, okay, so I will um, just briefly talk about this with some research I did a couple of years ago with a colleague of mine named Tim Huang, and we were looking at the history of aviation litigation. Um, or sort of litigation around aviation autopilot. That is what happened when um, 
there were accidents and then lawsuits were brought against um, aviation autopilots, which are a kind of proto-autonomous system. Long story short, two articles about it, you can go read it. Long story short is that there was a really interesting um, incongruity between how much control of a flight was actually um, uh, was, was sort of being taken by the machine, by the computer. As this says, you know, 99% of the time you're flying is, is through the automated system. Um, but that was, um, as sort of control over flying time was allocated to machines and computer systems, the amount of responsibility, both legal and kind of social perceptions of responsibility, remained squarely on the body of the pilot. Um, and we looked at this in a kind of couple of other different contexts in which there were large scale accidents within complex socio-technical systems. And we saw that the operators um, ended up being what we called, they were moral crumple zones. They kind of got, they, they soaked up the blame of an accident. Um, and unlike the, right, the idea of a crumple zone in a car is that it absorbs the, the impact in a crash and it protects the human. Well, in the context of an automated or um, autonomous, a sort of semi-autonomous system, the idea of the moral crumple zone is that there's a human there, and the moral crumple zone is protecting the integrity of the technological system at the expense of the human. So to kind of tie that in, so this actually was exactly what happened in the um, Uber accident, in which the pedestrian walking her bike was killed um, in Arizona last year. Uh, the, the initial kind of press reports were talking about, oh, Uber, self-driving car, crashes, kills someone. It quickly turned into a discussion of, well, was the safety driver actually doing their job? And well, this was actually a problem with the safety driver. And in fact, uh, a, a couple months ago, Uber was released from having any kind of criminal negligence, but the safety driver is facing um, vehicular manslaughter charges. And so this is, this is really interesting to me because it points out something which was, which I wish had been talked about more in the documentary, which is the different ways in which intersectional power dynamics are gonna be at play when we think about the world that is reformed when we have all of these technological integrations. And so to kind of loop back, right, because, because the people who are gonna be sort of in a position that is precarious, in a position that is um, a crappy job, is, is, and they're gonna be held responsible for something which was not in their control, it's gonna be the people who are um, in some way vulnerable or who are at the edges. Um, and so I think that talking about race and talking about the kind of intersectional dynamics that are at stake in these kinds of technologies is absolutely uh, imperative. And I think that uh, the inequality question is both important because we have to talk about all the different kinds of biases, but also all the kinds of perspectives that get to say what the future is around these technologies, right? And so I think it's also important to have not just economists and entrepreneurs, um, but kind of a wide range of people who are getting to shape the story about what the future of AI and work is. I have another one for Elizabeth. Do you, right, so I really think that, and we're gonna make this quick as then we can take some questions from the audience. Um, I think it's really great that as a scholar you go out and sort of do this kind of work together with James and sort of step out of the academy and sort of do public, you know, public scholar work. And so my question for you, as a public scholar and a historian is, how can we ensure that this happens more? How can we ensure that scholars, for once, but, but also activists, how, you know, participate in the, in the artificial intelligence discourse more actively, but also specifically history? Because earlier is, you said, you know, history always, kind of always has the answer, and <laughs> we can talk about that, but um, I think the important message there is there are multiple perspectives and history is one important one. And so you've done work on that front. And so how can we push that out 
further into the AI space? Um, well, I mean, I, I obviously think of films like this are, as part of the goal. Um, I just think that history, there's no way to know the future on um, almost any of these things we've just talked about. <laughs> We're all guessing. Um, and we need to be guessing because we've got to try to anticipate, you know, what could happen and, and make, uh, you know, anticipate it in a good way that create appropriate social programs. But the value of history is that it does give us some recipes um, for what has worked. The past is the best predictor of the future. And, um, and in that sense, we do know there are things we have done in the past that have produced useful effects. Um, we do know that, um, you know, there are controversies that should we, some people are like, even now, like, should we have safety nets? I mean, it's craziness. Uh, and, you know, government is what separates us from animal, other animals, right? Our ability to invent cooperative solutions to social problems. That's what government is. So we need to be what, taking care of those social um, programs. Um, we need to be using history to say, listen, how did we get to be so awesome? We did it by educating our populace. We, that's, we did it. That's when we became the world's wealthiest country. We are now 31st. So 31st in the world is going to have long-term effects. And I don't just mean that as a competitive thing vis-a-vis -vis other countries. I just mean as like, we're really slacking. We're really lazy. We're really not paying attention as a country. <laughs> you know, so you know, I really applaud the work of other scholars and James is, you know, making an effort to make a, a very hard and very comprehensive film and Eduardo, the work that you're doing. I just think we have to all keep doing it and know that um, it's an interesting problem. We're a country that's based on the idea that all people are equal and yet we're also a country that's based on the idea of merit, which means that we are going to struggle and with unequal outcomes in terms of how we end up in the world. That's something we also applaud that we tend not to talk about and I think it's a, it's a heart, we're squaring a circle there I think we just have to have these conversations more and more. Thank you. I'm gonna be mean and sort of <laughs> cut you off and, and take questions from the audience. Um, we have one here. If you could say who you are asking. <laughs> oh. Hello. Um, my name is Lee Bendet and I'm actually uh, a retoucher, a digital retoucher and artist and uh, I have a lot of experience in different jobs and layoffs and things like that. And retraining, which was very good back when these things happened in the late 80s and I got into computer graphics. And although I wasn't in a union, I was able to get a retraining package at SVA and learned all about computer graphics. So that was a wonderful thing, but what has been going on in the last several years, as I think you all notice, is that we have an economic political philosophies that have gotten more extreme as time has gone on. And so I try to figure out exactly when, maybe in Nixon's White House and into Reagan, that we started getting this neoliberal theory which said government doesn't do anything but protect you in war and policing. And they don't want government doing anything else. Now, true, Time Inc. was very good about the retraining. It was a great company. About a few years before that, Reagan got in, and all of a sudden they started talking about profit centers. And we started worrying about Wall Street and takeovers and things like that. So I think there were like multiple levels of problems here. When I look at this film, I love it because it sort of speaks to my more progressive sensibilities, but then I say to myself, but the reason why we have a lot of these problems is because we're really not a progressive country anymore. We don't believe in education and retraining, and we're not doing anything for people. We're helping Wall Street and the Pentagon and private contractors, and we're really not working on the people of this country, and that's why there's so much anger. But I feel like we can't get through because these people are convinced of something, another kind of system. Do we, can I just sure. add one quick sort of, something quick. that you know, was really strikes me when, when we talk about sort of what used to be is also there are a lot of sort of comfortable narratives that we sort of can 
talk about in terms of everyone flourished, right? And everyone got retraining and everyone, and I think that also, given that this is an American specific film, we also have to think about the fact that um, white men in particular, and then other kinds of people in various sort of pockets or communities were sort of privileged by the kinds of opportunities and systems that were built. And so that's something that I think, I obviously, I love history as a, as a methodology. And I think that's something that I struggle with in terms of, you know, how do we think about an American past which is profoundly flawed and has left us in a profoundly terrible sort of situation, and yet we do need to take lessons from the past. And so I think that it's, it's, it's a tough sort of balance to think about, but I think that both of those sides have to be acknowledged. Do we have more questions? Okay, so sorry, we're gonna go from the back. We ha we, we're gonna take, sorry, three at a time, please. You and then the next row, and then we have one over there. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, good evening. Myself, Dr. Shiva. I'm, I'm associating with the uh, Safe Lab at Columbia. Uh, so, yeah, Dr. Deshman was here and he just left. And, uh, like, my focus is much more on uh, online crime against children. It's like online crime is keep escalating uh, in these days when we are growing with the uh, AI and other technology. What, what do you think, uh, how AI could serve uh, for social good, and particularly if if we want to prevent online crime against children or online pornography and, and things like that, and uh, what do you think the future and uh, what we have learned from the past as a history? Okay, who is this question for? Big um, one, Madeline. Okay. Yes. Okay, we're gonna take three. Okay, next one. I'm Jerry Marlowe. I'm a freelance writer. I have a couple of degrees from NYU. I was uh, somewhat startled by the optimism of the film. <laughs> um, not so much about the technology, but uh, the role of the uh, artificial intelligence in our society. Because through the years, we've progressed from a, a society in the, in the 50s that focused on management. And I think the CEO got 30 times the average worker's salary. And then marketing was had its heyday in the 60s, and then everything became finance and law, where all that matters is increasing shareholders' wealth. Uh, that's the driver for everything. And then the Republican Party encourages that. And then you have artificial intelligence sort of feeding into this capitalism. And you have the, uh, the inequality is not just an inequality of wealth, but also an inequality of power. So, you put all that together, and, and I find the, the combined di dynamic exciting as, as the capitalists use uh, technology to sort of homogenize and reduce the, the roles and the independence of workers and uh, put workers all over the world in competition with one another. So I'm just asking the filmmakers, uh, doesn't, doesn't this interplay between capitalism and inequality and, and artificial intelligence kind of uh, uh, qualify your optimism a little bit? Okay, so this is for Elizabeth and James. Hold your thoughts. We had one more question in the back. Over. Oh, two, sorry, two more questions. Okay, we're gonna, three more. Three more. Yeah. Okay. Mona, why don't you answer those two and then we'll take two sure. more. Okay, let's go. Melon, go first on child. Oh, um, okay. Uh, I'll answer the capitalism question. I'm going to let you go to the other question. <laughs> but I, I know Jim has a lot to say on this too. Um, you know, it, it's one of these things. There's, you can have a, a big philosophical conversation, of course, about what would be the optimal social system. Um, and uh, you know, there's always the famous quote by Winston Churchill, democracy is the worst of all social systems except all, all the others that have been tried. And I think that capitalism, of course, has many faces and many forms and different countries handle the same kinds of problems differently. But overall, it is the case 
that um, that systems which are free, meaning people can freely compete, that there is no top-down management of who does what when, have produced more wealth. It's just what has happened. It, again, the future couldn't tell us what might happen differently. You know, we know that there have been other systems, um, communist systems, which have been tried with high hopes, um, noble ideals, um, and did not produce what they were hoped to produce. And this, I, I, it's interesting, I wrote another book, and uh, James helped to make the movie about American umpire, this, you know, China doesn't become a, co a capitalist country, which it essentially is now, because the U.S. wins the Cold War. It's because they get tired of being poor. And so they start allowing private incentives. Now this, by the way, the riot, there's a tremendous rise in inequality in China, and at the same time, a tremendous rise in the overall level of the society, and bringing many, many people out of terrible poverty, you know, life-threatening poverty. So it's just this kind of not, I don't even like the phrase, not a pretty picture, because it's an ugly picture, but it's also a picture in which we all sit around and have lattes and discuss it. Now, I don't mean all of us, but I just mean overall, life expectancy has grown, come up, and, um, and it is capitalism that has produced it, like it or hate it. It has, historically. Eduardo had some really yeah, briefly. I just wanted to, wanted to pitch in on this question of power and inequality. Um, first, I think that there was some bits that are really important that were missing from this conversation, perhaps on purpose because its focus was so much on, you know, on economic well-being. But the, uh, th this, this AI future is going to affect us in non-economic ways that are super important. Um, so for instance, just to debate over privacy. What this is going to do to our sense of privacy, which is something that has not really changed that much over hundreds of years and is now just being revolutionized every day, and how that will play in the political system, I think is going to be a very important driver or shaper of, of AI into the future. Um, the idea of the amplification of communication, which we at first believed to be only good and which now we're seeing has potentially terrifying consequences, which again will also play into the politics and to the social response to artificial intelligence. So I think that, um, that, that, that these other kind of like not economic arguments I could see them stopping a, um, uh, some forms of AI from developing. So the idea that Facebook was allowed to just become like humongous, I think a lot of, a lot of parliaments and governments are rethinking that. And who knows where, I mean, where that can go. I know the cat's out of the bag, it's hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube, but nonetheless, I can see that we will be much more careful, or we might be much more restrictive and push much more back against some of the future developments that we could see down the pipeline. And then more, kind of like more specifically to the Eduardo. idea of power. Okay, Quick. I'll stop. So, so <laughs> I almost Because we have it. two more questions on five more minutes. <laughs> and also we have Madeline on the question of children. I'm not an expert in children. I mean, Dr. Dr. Patton, you, you, you guys will know the answers more than I. So for the sake of time, let's just. Keep going. Great. We'll pick it up afterwards. We have two more in the back. Three more. Apologies. We're going to take all of them at the same time, please. Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's an important um, documentary, and I'm very impressed with its concern for um, about, uh, you know, the implementation of, uh, you know, the, the new technologies and artificial intelligence improving the lives of, quote, everyone, unquote, because... Uh, the film doesn't acknowledge the fact that um, in the last, I don't know, was it 30 or 40 years when, um, you know, those, that golden age of the, the, uh, the, the man who could have a well-paying, not particularly high-skilled job and support his family, et cetera, and those disappeared and the economy changed. And what's not acknowledged seemingly, and I'm not an historian or an economist, but those kinds of jobs were outsourced. For example, uh, the man who's the Nike guy, the billionaire, he, from what I understand, is still paying people a dollar a day in his sweatshops, um, and those are jobs that if Americans had them, they would be 
expected to have you know some sort of reasonable hourly pay and how about hey this having some benefits and I thought it was interesting that that gentleman Dorian Dorian Warren um, was crying he deplored the fact that corporations you know had to gosh pay benefits when China and and other countries didn't do that when they employed people. Well, gee, you know, in America, that's kind of a good idea. Anyway, um, so I'm impressed with, as far as I know, the Nike guy, I can't think of his name. Yeah, right, and he's still doing that. I mean, unless I'm wrong, okay? But um, that outsourcing of these jobs, that was really, um, you know, very instrumental in you know, the impact it made on the American economy when then people had to start taking, you know, crummy, quote, crummy, unquote, crummy jobs that paid little, or, you know, there are people today with raising kids who have two, three jobs and they still aren't making it, you know? So I just, I really admire that this film is concerned about improving everyone's lives through AI. And I'm just wondering, um, since we can't divorce these realities from the reality of the government and politics, what is the solution? How do we, you know, what's the solution that the government can somehow okay. support that, that notion so that's of everyone's lives being improved? So what's the solution? And that's for okay. the film. Okay, we have two more, really quickly, because we have to wrap up. Sorry, I'm a bioethicist. I'll yeah. try to be really brief. I have two questions. One is going back and looking at the bias issue. Largely, they learn from these super large data sets, which we code in our biases, and, and specifically in healthcare, like medical practitioners have bias. There's a pain bias related to women, things like that. When it comes to hiring, how do we deal with that? Um, how do we create other data sets? How do we make sure the right data is in those sets? And how do we make sure that we're not coding in the worst of ourselves? Um, into these machines. My second question relates to regulation on the government side of things. How do we deal with these issues like privacy and this moral crumple zone that you're talking about when people that are writing the regulation largely don't understand the evolution of technology and where it's going? Um, so how can we adequately protect people on that front? Okay, so that's bias and regulation. And then we have a third question, please. Yes, it's almost uh, uh, like the first question. Um, my name is Glidgy DuPont. I'm a business information risk officer for a bank. But the question is really for, um, do, do your, your name? Yes. Um, it's, I'd like you to define more or speak more to the notion of crumminess about these jobs. Because um, from my perspective, yes, there, was, there is people on the edges, as, as you say. But it seems like, um, you know, the future has changed, right? I know friends from college who's never been in an office, right? And, they, and you couldn't change their mind. Uh, I have a friend who, who works for an insurance company, and he works from home, and he doesn't want to change that. Uh, I know a couple who lives in Roatan and is managing a business, um, you know, just because of the space that you talk about, this is the business incorporation, right? Um, so, is it, can you talk more about uh, this crumminess that you're talking about, how do you define crumminess, right? I mean, there's project managers. So she said so a lot of those jobs went away um, overseas, but some of the people that those jobs have left, right, that left these people, some of them have turned to, out to be project managers managing those people overseas and, and, and not going to the office eight hours a day. Or, you know, they're working, there's a notion now you can work three or four days a week instead of a five-day week because you could do more because of the efficiency. So, okay, so. so we have, we're gonna start with the first one, which I think was for it. I'm gonna give Jim the question about outsourcing. S solu okay, we're gonna go the, we're gonna do the solutions question first. So we, I don't know, let's track in my mind. <laughs> do you wanna take that one? Sure, and what is the solution? Um, you know, when you, making a documentary film is sometimes like being a marriage counselor. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've heard that good, really good marriage therapists um, know they're doing their job when each person thinks that the therapist is on the other person's side, um, because that opens up the conversation. Um, and so I think the most important thing, I, is there a solution? You know, there are a lot of documentaries that are very advocacy oriented that say, here is the answer. And I always resist that, because 
I think the answer is for us to talk about these issues. You know, this is an issue to me like climate change. It's so big, it's so important, and it's so critical to our future that we often don't talk about it. So my hope is the solution is to, as a filmmaker, hopefully present something that will create conversations. And we have built around this, if you go to our website, we have a full high school curriculum college curriculum and community curriculum around after you've seen this film, what do you think about this issue? What do you think about that issue? And I think just like climate change and all these other big important issues, I think we have to, you know, an election's coming up and we have to make these questions the questions we ask people that are running for office. What are you gonna do about it? These are our concerns and so, I don't have a solution. I don't think any one of us has a solution, but I'm hoping that as a community and as a society, the more we talk about these things, we will come up with something. Great, the next one was, I think, for Madeline about bias. Oh, gosh. I mean, this is a whole huge set of literatures and conversations that are, you know, currently underway, and I think, you know, the number, the only real answer is you know, in, in many ways, a similar sort of um, end point, which is that we're never gonna solve bias. Um, we need to think, I think also we should maybe be thinking of shifting the frame away from bias and more talking about what do we mean, like, what are we trying to say? Are we trying to talk about equality? Are we talking about equity? Are we talking about justice? Are we talking about equal access to opportunities? And then we can think about, okay, given what data sets we have, given what um, models are being developed, right? we can begin to think about, okay, how do we take what we have and be sure that it's more finely tuned to what the outcome that we want is. Um, there are a lot of computer scientists thinking about this. Um, uh, Desmond Patton, who was here earlier, also just wrote a really wonderful piece about how um, actually all kinds of um, community organizers and community experts need to be part of the bias discussions. It can't just be um, computer scientists. Of course, I want to vote for the anthropologists as well. And the social scientists, historians, right? This needs to be like a multi, um, everyone, everyone needs to be involved. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really important question and it also gets to a lot of discussions around um, diversity in tech. And, you know, who are the talking heads that we have? And who are the, like, majority of tech companies right now? Or who are the majority sort of employees as opposed to contractors? Right, who might who might look differently? Um, so I think that there are all kinds of ways in which we can begin to we can begin to work and not just criticize, but actually take actions to um, combat what is currently being described as kind of the the problem in AI bias. There was a second part to the what was the second part to the question? Regulation. Oh right. Oh, regulation. Okay. Like, oh, could I pipe in a little bit? Really quick. Ten seconds. This is always a problem with new technologies, right? And new technologies come in and they provide benefits and they create damage. We've seen that, the elephant, right? Which I love elephants and I hate to put it in there, but we saw with television, right? When television first arrived, it was a wonderful thing, but there were cigarette ads being played during um, uh, cartoon hour. And we learned, hey, that's not a great thing to sell cigarettes to kids, so why don't we regulate against it? So. Regulation has always been an important part of these new technologies to enable, to, to enable us to, you know, reduce the harmful benefits while providing, but it's often we don't know about it until it happens. And I think in social media we're seeing, you know, now some of those cigarette ads uh, show up and we have to figure out, you know, what's the best way to handle it. Oh, and, and so then that brings up a kind of another culture shift in tech, which is that maybe we have to stop moving fast and breaking things because sort of saying, oh, we don't know what will happen when we do this. Like, that's, that's not okay. <laughs> that's all I have to say. Yeah. Agreed. Um, Eduardo. Oh, um, so I have a really, not a very sophisticated, a fairly simple notion of what I mean by crummy job. 
and it's a job that doesn't pay well. 25 grand a year, 30 grand a year is a crummy job. But it's, it's, that is a very common job in this country. If you look at, um, or, it's a, or it's a job that al- offers very little future. So if you look at the job of every person who has less than a bachelor's degree in this country, the median wage, and I've just looked at that data to get today, so that's why I know it, um, um, is lower than it was in the year 2000. So if you have an associate's degree, or out of high school, or don't had a couple of years of college, or don't have high school, you're making about 10% less than you were making 19 years ago. So that is kind of like a, a definition that I, I would use as crummy jobs, and it's a really a very large share of our employment, and in fact, it's a growing share of our employment. So even as you get these high-tech jobs, you know, that that come with technology, if you look at the vast majority of where the jobs are growing most, it's in jobs paying 25 grand, 30 grand a year. The fastest growing occupation over the next 10 years, according to the BLS, is gonna be some variety of home health aid. And they pay 25 grand. And second or third place is some version of fast food uh, uh, employee, 25, 30 grand. If you look at the, the top 10 fastest growing occupations, according to the, the Department of Labor, uh, the uh, eight of them or seven of them are you know twenty five to forty grand a year so that's that's the concern over the quality of employment it, it doesn't really you know that's there's no other kind of measure of permanence that I can think of okay <laughs> last word to Elizabeth a word of hope a word of hope <laughs> well I, you know I, I, I understand all of this stuff and you know I mean I the points that are brought up as, as the downside are terribly important. Um, I guess the historical perspective, I think, I still think is a value. We live in a world that in most ways is much, much better than it was 50 years ago, than it was 100 years ago. You know, it's, but history is not a simple process. It isn't. What we look at is sort of these long-term trends. One of the problems, what you just said is, you know, I understand the impulse. We gotta be careful not to break stuff, right? I totally get that. And at the same time, as human beings, we've been breaking stuff since time immemorial. And that's part of this creative process. Um, you know, I, I think the Steven Pinker book, you know, which is sort of a, like, by the way, oh, we all live pretty well. It's pretty, I mean, we have crummy jobs, but it is also pretty doggone crazy how much better we live, how much longer we live, than people, than our grandparents, than our great grandparents. It just is. And so when we emphasize so much the problems that we have, we take the heart out of things. We take courage away from people. We, you know, spend, send them further into a cycles where we feel like, you know, there's nothing we can do and we have no power. And that's just not true. So onward. Thank you. On that notion, please join me in thanking our panel for bringing their work, expertise, and time to this space.